Thank you very much, Kamahi Mahana, Kia Koto. Greetings to everybody. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has just released our second report on impact, adaptation and vulnerability. It's the second in a series of three major reports. The first, which was at the end of last year, looked at physical science and the issues around what's got us to 1.1 degrees of warming um, above the 1880s. And the next report, which comes out in April, will look at um, how we can actually cut emissions. But this report considers the way in which we can adapt and protect our communities in a changing climate. Uh, just a little bit about the um, Climate by Numbers uh, report. So there were 270 authors and I was a co-lead with my colleagues Mark Palling um, and David Dodman of the Cities and Infrastructure chapter and I'm very grateful to both the this whole cities and infrastructure team, and also the resilience um, team in the summary report. 67 countries contributed authors. Uh, for the first time, we had approximating some equity in our gender balance with 41% of women in this report. And I think that reflects a larger participation of social science. We have a really diverse group of academics and researchers who contributed to this. It gives us a growing scientific knowledge and understanding about the way in which cities can adapt. About 43% of our authors came from a developing economy and about 57% from um, developed uh, country economies. So what I would like to do now is to turn to some of the key findings of the report overall and draw out some of the issues for urban cities. The report is clear that for a start, the scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and to health of the planet. And any further delay is going to miss the brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity we have. So the report has tried to think about solutions for the world. And one of the focuses that's really significant about this report has been on indigenous knowledge. The report recognises the value of a diverse for forms of knowledge, scientific, uh, indigenous and local knowledge in helping us to adapt. I would really like to thank, um, in particular, New Zealand's UC's Prof Tamari To and also um, the Vice Chair Dr Yuba Sakona and many authors who've worked to make sure that this report is different in focusing on the importance of indigenous and local knowledge. Um, Tamari and Tuahiwi hosted the land report uh, IPCC authors back in 2018 and part of this cycle and it was an important conversation in which we started to think about the way in which Indigenous knowledge helps all of us. But another far-reaching and interesting impact of this report is the way it highlights um, adaptive solutions that are effectable and feasible and confirmed um, issues of justice and that's defined as both procedural justice, distributive justice and recognition justice. So the issues in this report are different because we are acknowledging and 195 governments signed off that climate impacts have human rights effects and they have effects for justice. The report uh, is clear that um, global warming has caused dangerous and widespread disruption in nature and that's causing uh, extreme events on land and the ocean and driving mass mortality. But the climate is also affecting the lives of billions of people. Despite our best efforts to adapt, we are approaching the limits of adaptation. And there is concern in this report about our ability to adapt over 1.5 degrees and particularly over two degrees of warmed world. In the report, we talk about loss and damage, and we define it not as the Warsaw Mechanism, which focuses particularly on developed uh, countries' issues, but in this report, we focus on um, observing and documenting harm and projected risk, and that includes both economic and non-economic risk. Cities are crucibles of risk, but they are also places in which we have an opportunity to to affect far-reaching and transformative change. The climate impacts are magnified in cities where more than half the world's population now lives. By 2050, 
two thirds of the world's population are expected to live in cities. This mega trend is already experienced here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where 86% of our population lives in cities. But in the next uh, 20 years, 20 to 30, um, we're expecting 2.5 billion people with about 90% of that growth in Asia and Africa to be moving into urban settlements. So urbanisation is an important site and that's one of the reasons that it's been such a significant focus in this report. But also one of the interesting and important aspects of this report is to focus on new kinds of risks, the cascading and compounding nature of risk. In the New Zealand chapter, chapter 11, which is led by New Zealander Dr Judy Lawrence and colleagues, they focus on, for example, the way in which an extreme snowfall, extreme rain, extreme wind events impact on road networks, on power and on water supply. Now these can be rapid onset events which have significant knock-on effects for information technology, for our social infrastructure, thinking about where our schools are built, for example, our airports and our ports, and the way in which we can experience ongoing and widespread disruption which can cascade into larger regional and um, significant national and even international events because many of our cities are now intensely and intricately connected as nodes or networks. They're not just individual communities, they're networked in terms of their supply with and um, remittance economies with trade not only with each other, but particularly with surrounding peri and ru rural urban areas. So as a whole, one of the new focuses of the report has been a new understanding of the interconnections. We can no longer think in silos. We've known this individually, but the report weighs in on the evidence that we need to look across the climate, biodiversity, human society and well-being if we're going to tackle the many global challenges we face today. Climate change also combines with the unsustainable use of natural resources, habitat destruction that's part of the growing process of inequality and urbanisation that we're seeing globally. These trends present not only threats to ecosystems and the people who rely on them, but they also reduce the capacity of nature, communities and individuals to be able to adapt and cope with a changing climate. Urbanisation is linked to new intensive forms of resource exploitation which threatens vulnerable land and ecosystems. So we need to think very carefully and the report highlights the importance of uh, urban land use and planning. One of the issues that's been high, uh, picked up globally in the media has been the way in which people are highly vulnerable now. 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in hotspots that are highly vulnerable to climate change. These are in large part in Africa, as well as South Asia, Central and South America, small islands and the Arctic. But there are also places of risk within our cities. And those who are at greatest risk are the most marginalised and the most isolated. So the lessons we've learnt in COVID also apply in climate. It's the poor, the elderly, the disabled, indigenous and ethnic minorities and children who are most vulnerable to the climate change effects. And they're facing overlapping challenges. Limited access to water, sanitation and health services, high levels of dependence on climate sensitive livelihoods, particularly for smallholder farmers and fishing communities of all increased vulnerability. But so too have high levels of poverty and inequality, weak or uh, political leadership or lack of political will to affect change, lack of funding and finance is critical, particularly we'll talk a little bit later about lack of funding for adaptation. A lack of accountability and trust in government is also hampering our efforts to really affect uh, um, change. And the report is telling us that even small increases in warming will result in increased risk. Looking to the future, in particular, for example, increased rates of heat are affecting, uh, in urban areas, health, well-being and mortality, and they will have increasing effects on productivity um, over time by 20, uh, 
2050, we're expecting perhaps a rate of 20% uh, loss of productivity as a result of heat. Nature's services support all aspects of our lives, and this has been an important message of the report, from pollina uh, pollination and tourism to our health and our climate regulation. The loss of our ecosystems and their services has cascading long-term impacts for people globally, especially indigenous and local communities who directly uh, depend on them. Well-functioning ecosystems, particularly in urban areas, have co-benefits and synergies. Public parks, urban forests, street trees, urban gardens, koanga kai, have co-benefits in regulating temperature, in supporting mental health and well-being, physical activity, in regulating air quality, and supporting alternative forms of food security and community um, capital and social co uh, cohesion building. Looking ahead to the um, future risks that we're expecting, heat stress, as I've said, is a, a major issue at approximately um, two degrees of uh, warming, however, we're also expecting that regions that are particularly dependent on snow melt could experience a 20% decline in water availability for agriculture after 2050. In the New Zealand chapter, again, the New Zealand authors note that water security is a key issue here in New Zealand, both urban and agricultural. And we know globally that climate change is undermining um, food security. At two degrees of warming by 2050, people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Central and South America and small islands are likely to expect food shortages and malnutrition. Perhaps for those who are living in New Zealand and 65% of the country lives within five kilometres of the coast, it's important to consider that a billion people are now living in low-lying cities and settlements that are projected to be at risk from sea level rise and related hazards, including coastal inundation. We have a global perspective here, but each region has a particular um, focus on cities and the risks that those cities face. If we think uh, generally about New Zealand for a minute, the work by Anita Rearford, uh, Judy um, Lawrence, and also the, the whole team in the urban chapter, has noted that New Zealand has a great emphasis at the moment on rebuilding after disasters, but needs a greater emphasis on anticipatory building. This has higher costs up front, but saves money over the long term. The other kinds of risks that we're facing overall are perhaps not immediately obvious, but very serious, are risks to social cohesion and community well-being. If communities have to be moved, face regular and repeated disruption events, the kinds of uh, coastal flooding and ocean, and, um, or even the inland floodings that we've seen, if we think for a minute about the floods in the west coast that we've just recently experienced. Um, so proactive investment in urban development, including a whole range of infrastructure, not only our physical and grey infrastructure, but our emphasis on social infrastructure, on health, on housing, on income insurance and replacement, and on our ecological infrastructure has been critical, as is learning from other cities and networking with those cities. Some of the key headline factors um, that have come from cities, uh, which are useful to think about, is that in all cities, in urban areas, um, risk is faced by people and assets. And we are unequivocal in this report that climate impacts are felt disproportionately in cities on the most socially, economically marginalised, who will be most affected. One of the things that we've noticed since the last reports of seven years ago is that many more cities around the world have developed adaption plans, but far fewer have actually implemented those plans. We're also noticing a real pressure on governance capacity. The literature suggests that the strain on local government, the need for much, much greater financial support, particularly adaptation, and the pressure to deal with the legacy of infrastructure that wasn't developed to face the climate risks that we now uh, see is constraining our ability to adapt. There's some good news. The literature and the research suggests overall 
that the greatest gains in well-being in cities can be achieved by prioritising investment to reduce climate risk for the lowest income and most marginalised residents. We note that extreme heat events are expected to affect half of the future urban population by 2100. That urban expansion and land use and land cover is impacting our flooding and flood incidents. But the good news is that land use planning is one of the key actions we can take to advance equity and to also protect our communities. Action on adaptation has increased, but the progress has been uneven and we're simply not adapting fast enough. Growing public and political awareness of climate impacts and risks has resulted in at least 170 countries developing adaptation plans which recognise climate risk, but it's now implementing those plans that's crucial. And the report talks about this very narrow closing window of opportunity. This means implementing the plans and taking action within this decade. We are also seeing increasing um, gaps between adaptation action taken and what's needed. These gaps are largest amongst low populations and they're expected to, uh, low income populations and they're expected to grow. But there are options we can take to reduce the risks to people and nature. And if we turn our attention to what we can do, there are very positive ways in which we can learn and work with nature and ecosystems. So as, alongside our grey infrastructure planning, thinking about integrating working with nature matters. But the important caveat of this in this report is that ecosystem services will decline and face limits after 1.5 degrees of warming and certainly after two. So when we think about adaptation, our first thoughts might be around reducing flood risk, preventing water shortages, but the report is also saying we need to think about social infrastructure because one of the biggest risks that urban communities face at the moment is that many of our actions to adapt have been incremental and in particular areas which have transferred risk to the next community. Think about, for example, seawalls that are built that simply transfer the risk of um, erosion and scouring to the next beach. Um, we need to think about the ways in which we support underlying populations who are experiencing trauma of extreme events and will increasingly experience trauma of extreme events. Even though we've worked on this report for five years, there are some moments that really take me aback when I read it over. One of them is that children born this year are likely to experience, after 1.5 degrees of warming, four times the increase in extreme event in their lifetime by 2100, when they'll only be in their late 70s. So if we think about um, what we can do in terms of working with nature, nature offers significant and untapped potential to reduce climate risks and deal with the causes of climate change, improving people's lives and livelihoods. Um, we know, for example, that building with nature and involving nature in our um, cities and urban planning makes an enormous difference to shade, to passive cooling. So while we need a range of um, opportunities to uh, reduce flooding, to cool our towns and cities, we also need to think about how we're doing this when we're planning our urban infrastructure and building new homes and houses. Some of the key issues, and I couldn't resist putting a local example from Akaroa, are water management that are affecting cities and towns and communities around the world. Securing drinking water, enough water in the right place at the right time that's safe to drink is extremely important and a challenge for increasing numbers of cities. But so too is flood and drought and risk management, and working again with nature and land use planning is critical here. The good news is that the research shows that there is growing youth and adult community awareness through social media, through commercial media, particularly through public and mainstream media. We've advanced climate awareness and understanding. People are, are understanding more about the legitimacy of adaptive action, particularly in large urban areas.
But again, even working with nature, our effectiveness declines with increased levels of warming. So acting now matters. The report itself at a, more, at a wider level talks about the importance of food security. And I would just note that in urban contexts, there's an interesting discussion in the report about the way in which urban food gardens, Konga Kai, other examples here in New Zealand, um, have important not only nutrition value, but capability and network building and social connection. By 2050, urban areas, as we say, will be home to two thirds of the world's population. While this report notes that in COVID we've seen some move back to rural areas, the overall mega trend of urbanisation provides a window of opportunity to actually ensure that we are planning for the changes and the risks that are coming. So that means things like, as we've said, nature-based and engineering approaches together. It can mean establishing green and blue networks, not just the individual ponds and wetlands, but thinking about how we can network these across cities. Active transport, social safety nets, and then also the wider benefits that we see for supporting our populations in general and improving public health. One of the important areas of discussion in the report beyond New Zealand, but it has implications for New Zealand, is adapting and working with informal settlements. So thinking about the way in which we work with communities in Africa and Asia in particular and in small islands, where communities are growing rapidly and developing their own infrastructure, actually rather than imposing decisions from afar, the re all of the research is showing um, a high confidence in working with local knowledge, engaging local communities, involving residents in decision making, and ensuring that institutional change is accountable, that there is political commitment and transparency. And these lessons can be translated directly to the global north as well. Because one of the key messages that comes through in this report is that urban resilience is enhanced when we work in an integrated manner, integrating our mitigation and adaptation, but when we work in partnership with local communities as well as national and regional government. It's not a matter of being led from the ground or led from the top. It has to be partnerships, which has come through strongly in this report. As I say, the issues of risk transfer have also come through in terms of thinking about the ways in which we're developing grey infrastructure. The most disadvantaged groups are the most affected by maladaptation, the adaptation that results in unintended consequences. For example, incre increased climate-related risks or increased uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The photograph of the le on the left is sea defences that may not be strong enough to protect the people living behind them. But people can be lulled into a false sense of security, they can move into a greater position of uh, risk, and we create a moral hazard as people invest sometimes their whole life savings into their homes, which are in places of great high risk. The other example is drawn from Delaware in the US, but there are many examples around the world where it's possible to work with nature to provide for flood protection. Indigenous people, ethnic minorities, have many examples of the ways in which you can work with nature and communities in order to protect your whole society. As we say in the report though, there are limits to adaptation. Adaptation cannot prevent all the losses and damages. Even with effective adaptation, limits will be re reached with higher levels of warming. Some natural solutions will no longer work over 1.5 degrees. Above 1.5 degrees, a lack of fresh water could mean that people living on small islands, those dependent on glaciers and snowmelt, can no longer adapt. The report also notes the increasing pressure on groundwater. And at two degrees, it may be especially challenging to farm multiple staple crops in many current growing areas, particularly in tropical regions. The report also talks about the financial constraints that we face in adaptation. We see that global uh, current financial flows are insufficient, particularly in developing countries, where the overwhelming majority of global track climate finance has been targeted at emissions reduction and a very small proportion has been spent on adaptation. 
Climate impacts that result in higher levels of losses and damages also slow down economic growth and reduce the availability of finance, of finance resources for other tasks. I think as a reader, one of the uh, of other chapters, particularly the Africa chapter, for example, uh, chapter nine, one of the things that I was struck by, which has um, effects and resonance for urban areas elsewhere, is that the issue of carbon offsetting from one urban area or country to another can have knock-on cascading effects. If it leads to maladaptation in local communities in Africa, for example, where finances are spent on um, growing trees to offset uh, the carbon emissions in, in another country. These are ethical issues and justice issues that we need to think about. So the report is clear. To avoid mounting losses, urgent action is required to adapt to climate change. At the same time, it's essential to make rapid, deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions to keep the maximum number of adaptation options that we have available. So how do we accelerate adaptation? The report talks about political commitment and follow through across all levels of government. That means from local to national to international, we need political will. And it's interesting to me that 195 countries signed off and agreed to this statement, that the international framework is also needed each country needs an institutional framework that sets out clear goals and priorities that define responsibilities and this applies for urban planning as well as, as well as rural. We need enhanced knowledge of impacts and risks to improve responses and we particularly need greater monitoring and evaluation of adaptation measures which are essential to, uh, to track progress. It's very difficult at the moment to um, get enough data about climate um, effects in cities. There's interesting and important studies being done, but we need more data and there's large data gaps across the world. A common uh, theme that I've been stressing that's come through in all of the report is the importance of inclusive governance. Governance that prioritises equity and justice and direct participation by local communities. And in my dark moments, where personally I worry very much about climate, I find it remarkable that governments have signed off a report that speaks so strongly about the need for recognising human rights and justice and direct participation. This sets up a benchmark against which governments will be judged. But there are wide benefits for taking adaptation actions as well. For more than 3.4 billion people who live in rural areas, improved roads, uh, reliable energy, clean water and food security is critical. It contributes to reducing poverty. In our cities, green buildings, green spaces, clean water, renewable energy and sustainable transport all contribute to good health and well-being. Policies that increase youth's access to land, to credit, to secure housing, to knowledge and skills are important. They're both important for the rural economy, but they're also important for the urban economy. And restoring and connecting habitats can provide corridors for vulnerable species, as well as benefits for human uh, development and support. The report highlights some of the social um, and ecological and sustainable development goals that we, we have come to expect in terms of land, oceans and ecosystems. But I'd also like to highlight just here some of the critical um, uh, issues that are raised also for urban infrastructure and systems. So the green infrastructure and spending and investing on ecosystems and green infrastructure has well-being benefits and social development and sustainable development benefits as does the sustainable land use and urban planning and sustainable water and urban management. If you're looking closely at the report, in the urban chapter, chapter six, table 6.6 .6 shows that urban land use planning, careful planning, is one of the most supportive and uh, important actions we can take. We can continue to build infrastructure but it will not be enough if we have put people in harm's way.
So what is our future? Well, the report highlights the new developments in climate resilient development thinking. Reducing risks of adaptation, reducing uh, through adaptation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, enhancing biodiversity, and achieving sustainable development goals for all. The Climate Resilient Development Framework draws on wide-ranging knowledge, scientific, indigenous, local, and practical. And its Solutions Framework reminds us about the importance of working and conserving and restoring our ecosystems. It reminds us of the importance of involving marginalised groups and prioritising equity and justice in decision making. And again, I just remind us that it is remarkable that governments have signed off line by line on this summary report. As a political scientist, it is a very uh, huge shift from 10 years ago when many countries were disputing whether or not climate change was even happening. And it is difficult to reconcile different interests, worldviews, and values in decision making. But this is critical in terms of our planning and development. So climate resilient development is a solutions framework. It's encouraging us to scale up our investment, to scale up our international cooperation, and to start today. And to remember that everyday decisions and every action that we take matters. Worldwide action is more urgent than previously assessed. And climate resilient development is already challenging at our current global warming, but the prospects are going to be even harder as we cross the 1.5 or if we cross the two, the two degrees of warming. The science is clear. Our final statement in the summary report is that any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So the take home messages for urban areas, I think in summary, are in the frequently asked questions at the end of the um, urban report. Our observed uh, research shows that climate change is already impacting cities and particularly the most vulnerable. That future urban uh, development is going to need to consider the way in which there are key risks facing cities, heat, flooding, coastal inundation. And again, urban form and development is compounding these problems. That near-term action is crucial. It needs to be integrated making sure that each thing that we're doing in adaptation is also involving mitigation and not separated, that we are building our community's capacity to respond, that we are thinking about our social infrastructure, our social services, as well as our ecological services and our grey infrastructure, that climate resilience begins with careful urban land use planning, and that funding is a significant constraint worldwide and locally for governments and that decision making in partnership national local community tribal and the business sectors are all significant in making a difference for adaptation norera tena koto tena koto tena tato kato So that question about whether or not we are seeing a reverse trend back to rural communities, there is some evidence in the report, particularly in COVID, that there is some movement, but the global megatrend is already deeply urban. And in New Zealand, 86% of our urban population, and that ranges from small rural settlements through to our largest cities, um, is really significant. And I, uh, if we had a, a trend back to rural areas, that also raises a number of questions about urban, about infrastructure and support. Our small rural communities are already struggling to fund the, the development that they need. So the solution is not to demonise urbanisation, but to work with it for effective change. The question about whether Cabinet has been briefed 
Well, the good news and something that I was proud of actually, but I hadn't realised till the end of the report, is that the New Zealand government, along with Norway and Germany uh, and South Africa, were actually the funders of this report. So while the 270 scientists, we gave our time voluntarily for free, there are still um, uh, significant costs in technical services and science support for the IPCC. And there was a significant um, gratitude expressed to the government. So. I hope that this report lands at a time when we're developing the institutional infrastructure for development of water, land and urban planning, the rethinking of the Resource Management Act in a way that underscores some of the key issues that many experts that are watching and listening will already know, but it reminds us about why these issues are so important. The partnerships, the equity issues, uh, the ensuring that we have local accountability, enough finance, a connection from local to national and then international networks of cities is crucial. How bad do I think it could get? Over three or four degrees. I try not to think about that. I think that as my lovely colleague Dr Helen Adams in London said, it's not the climate that's our problem, it's us. And there, if you can recommend one really wonderful book that's just come out, Professor Karen O'Brien in Norway is uh, that never underestimate your ability to make a difference. And if we think about the way in which um, the youth climate movement has changed a conversation and Hans, um, the uh, co-chair of our working group, noted that the youth movements globally have shifted a conversation and public attention to understanding climate as a moral issue that we can change. It's not just a technical issue about emissions, it's about how we live now and how we want to live well. And we've seen the difference that we can make in COVID. And the good news about the changes that we need to make for climate is unlike social distancing and masking up, the changes we need to make for the climate are changes that make our lives easier. It's living well where you are with people that you love, reducing our consumption, thinking about developing our cities in ways that support where we live close to the areas in which we live. And these are positive benefits for life as well as positive benefits for the climate. Uh, yes, the discussions about maladaptation are really important because we need to think carefully about the actions that we take. Some of the actions that we're using, particularly if they involve large amounts of hard built infrastructure, uh, using concrete, uh, requiring greater driving, requiring greater transport, can have maladaptive effects. But at the moment, cities are sites of 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So everything that we do within cities is going to make a really significant difference long term to our climate. So the question, can our governance um, is our governance up to the task, is actually a challenge that Judy Lawrence and the team from New Zealand Writing Chapter 11 um, looked at. And they highlighted it as one of our key risks that we really need to think carefully about how our urban and local governance is working. Uh, and we've already seen, uh, just in the, in the challenges that are facing individual towns and cities with floods and long-term chronic strains like drought, that this is a very big cost to local cities. On the other hand, we also know that if people don't have a local voice in decision making and we don't have an equitable participatory process, the research is telling us we're unlikely to get effective solutions. So thinking carefully about what that looks like, one of the great opportunities we've got in New Zealand is that we are a small country. We are quite nimble, we can think carefully about our planning and we can also, as the research suggests, think about experimenting in an iterative, ongoing way with some of the new schemes for collaborative planning, 
and it's going to be difficult. We know even through COVID, not everybody is going to agree all the time. So democracies are not great uh, at solving some of these problems, but particularly speaking now as a political scientist within Aotearoa and, and not from the IPCC's point of view, democracies to use, to misquote Churchill, are our least worst solution or our best option. So actually thinking creatively about how we can make this work so that communities feel that decision making is accountable, that they are heard, that we're using Indigenous and local knowledge and practical experience, as well as bringing in the learning from internationally, the finance and support nationally to help communities is going to be crucial. And that means, yes, rethinking what our local government structures might look like. And there are a number of examples within Chapter 6 of the ways in which different cities and countries have been trialling this. From memory, the costs that we need to do anyway uh, for our infrastructure for just the project projected most moderate climate is something like $74 trillion globally by 2030 in terms of infrastructure spending. And the report is very clear, particularly in the, um, the cross-chapter uh, paper which has been written with our colleagues uh, in Working Group 3 on mitigation, our colleagues in the physical science chapter and our team in adaptation, where we have said it is much more effective to spend the money proactively now than have to retrofit existing uh, infrastructure. So I hope that starts to answer the question, but if you burrow into the numbers within the report, you can find more evidence. Well, at this point, I'm talking more generally about the ICC, IPCC report, so I can't really talk specifically about our cities. I think one of the um, messages from the report is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Each city is going to have to wrestle with the challenges that it faces, but the underlying issue for all cities is that in relative and absolute terms, investing in supporting your most marginal communities has the best wellbeing income, um, outcomes overall. And that's true for every city. And it's true for every urban planning decision, which is quite a strong statement from the IPCC, and again, signed off by 195 governments. Well, the report talks about the fact that what has been quite remarkable uh, um, has been the growing level of public literacy and understanding about climate. Our climate misinformation period was probably in the preceding last two decades. Now there is growing public awareness and increased literacy and understanding about climate change and about the actions that we can take. So while disinformation and misinformation is extremely difficult in the context of COVID, for example, the good news in this report is that there is far greater and growing public understanding about climate. And I think that's um, also because people are understanding through media that the experiences that they're having, if we just look at Brisbane at the moment, 50,000 homes without power yesterday, eight lives lost, um, this is climate change now. It has impacts now. So in terms of um, the Christchurch City Council's adaptation plan, again, I can't speak about individual cities at the moment when we're focusing more on the wider context of what matters globally and for every city. But if I was to think about the recommendations for solutions here, the IPCC has to be careful that it can't be policy prescriptive. But what I find interesting as a political scientist is its recommendations are pretty clear that um, we need to think about integrated planning. And this is a challenge, bringing our mitigation and our adaptation together that we need to ensure that Indigenous communities are strongly heard, 
and that local communities and local knowledge is, is strongly heard and that we have, where possible, a consensus and accountable um, approach to decision making. This is a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge for every country. But in New Zealand, we're up to challenges. We are small. As a country, we're only the size of some of the world cities that we're talking about. So we can do this. We just need to start. Yes, there's more in, this, in the report that's coming out in um, April about the way in which local food and urban food systems and composting and other actions can reduce emissions. But one of the interesting parts of this report is the way in which urban provisioning is particularly important again for low income communities. They highlight the fact that while it isn't going to replace our rural support and we need to make sure that we have strong food security for all cities, and there are many ways in which it's suggested that that can be tackled. Urban food gardening, koanga kai, other practices, are particularly important in low-income communities and they're particularly important for building resilience and social networking and social capacity, so, um, as well as um, mental health and well-being. So there are lots of benefits that are documented in here for local urban provisioning and food Well, I don't think we need to effectively uh, communicate the science of climate to the younger generation. I think we need to listen to them. <laughs> they are already understanding. And there is a dramatic difference across uh, most research that shows um, generational understanding of climate change. I think the reality is that we need to realise that we are not all in this together, that younger generations will be most affected over their life course and actually taking action now is what will affect the, the best outcomes. It also is great for mental health and wellbeing because we know eco-anxiety is a really growing issue and environmental uh, concerns and concern about climate change. But the research is telling us that what reduces that is taking practical action. Again, not to stray too far from this report, but New Zealand is wrestling with the issues that every country is wrestling with at the moment, is how do we allocate the finances that we need for the risks that are already here and are coming. If we think for a minute about the New Zealand debates, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there's a debate about how we provide for water infrastructure. Certainly starting to think about what sort of support and funding can come nationally, what partnerships we can develop um, globally and locally are critical. Um, but how that's delivered, the institutional structure of that legislation is a second um, is a second debate. I did find it very interesting in the research generally that there is a large gap in private sector engagement in adaptation. The leading, obviously, a private sector institution is insurance. But in terms of thinking about the ways in which the private sector can get involved in funding and supporting these issues, adaptation hasn't featured very um, highly in private business development and that's an area for growth as well. Yes, there's a quite an extensive discussion about energy and um, there are five systems transitions, in fact, which the report talks about, so I'm glad you've reminded me, that if we are going to have these far-reaching uh, changes, we need to not only think about urban and infrastructure as a megatrend, but we need to think very critically about our energy systems, about our land systems, about our oceans, uh, and about our industry um, and, and societal development. So, um, so energy is focused on, but in this report, it's focused on as how do we protect our, our current energy so sources and, and where are our biggest risks. The next report in mitigation talks about how we can reduce emissions and reduce overall energy demand. <laughs>
Yes, um, there is an extensive discussion in all chapters, but I would encourage you to have a look at chapter 18, Climate Resilient Development, which has got an extensive discussion about the no growth, degrowth um, debates and how it is that we can develop economies uh, that both support the needs of communities, enable innovation, and at the same time, reduce overall consumption. So um, that is an extensive and, and really significant challenge for every country and for every city. Uh, yes, there's quite an extensive, I um, think it is, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at it at the moment because I've been thinking about urban, but there's a, there's a chapter, I think it's chapter four, Food and Fibre, which has an extensive discussion about um, regenerative farming, um, the issues of uh, the challenges for all forms of rural uh, community development and rural farming as a sector, um, and food provisioning um, from developed to developing economies. It's almost like in a two-part sequel because this is a really key issue that will be dealt with in the mitigation um, report which comes out in April. But um, what this report talks about is that it is extremely difficult to achieve effective adaptation in highly unequal societies and that one of our um, one of the uh, findings of the report is that individual actions for adaptation or high investment and protection for local individual homeowners or communities can create very serious risk transfers for the surrounding communities. So we really need collective solutions, just as New Zealand has learned through COVID, it's through the collective action that we make the biggest difference. There is quite a discussion about um, insurance. Um, speaking not at the moment from the IPCC, but just generally, Tim Grafton here in New, in New Zealand has been very clear um, that the insurance industry, for example, won't regard um, sea level rise as a, an, a as a something we can't predict. Uh, I think insurance has really led a lot of our adaptation development and conversation as an industry. It's been right at the forefront of a lot of this work. And it's really now that our local government and our communities start to realise that we need to think about ways in which we can protect communities that don't encourage maladaptation, that don't encourage people to continue to locate and build in high risk areas. And again, that's where careful land use planning and collective solutions make an enormous difference. Are we investing enough in mitigation? Well. I'll have to say wait for report three, but what is really clear in this report is that we're not invest investing near enough in adaptation. So mitigation is crucial, but these actions have to be taken together. And at the moment, we only have about uh, one to every, um, about a quarter of the adaptation funding that we need globally. And these issues are important. So both together matters. And if you can find an action that both reduces emissions and protects your communities, then you've got a double win. Kia ora, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you.